Welcome to today's Energy Central Power Talk entitled SIP 0103 Software Verification for Compliance and Supply Chain Security Controls. Our keynote speaker is Dick Brooks, co-founder and lead software engineer for Reliable Energy and uh, <laughs> Analytics LLC. Dick Brooks is uh, the co-founder and he's responsible for the patent pending software Assurance Guardian Point Man software supply chain risk assessment application and the processes both SPDX and Cyclone DX, SBOM formats supported by the Department of Commerce, Com Commerce NTIA SBOM initiative. He has received an ANSI, uh, I can't even say this particular service award, I'm so sorry, Dick, in recognition for his work okay. on energy industry standards. Dick, thank you for coming on our call. You'll have to explain a little bit more about your background. Before we do, I just want to let the audience know that we will have um, a, a, an opportunity for questions uh, throughout the event, so certainly type those in as you think of them. Also, if you don't have a very good audio, you we have a telephone dial-in that you can click uh, using your interface, popping over to that audio section. Uh, we are uh, live today, and here's Dick to kick things off and tell us about all the things that I wasn't able to pronounce. Dick, welcome to the yeah. event. You have the floor. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. I, I hope you will find something that uh, uh, something useful that will help you in uh, implementing your, uh, your uh, protecting your digital ecosystems from the bad guys. Uh, that's the intent of this. This is a technical conversation, a technical talk, so we'll, we'll go through some uh, details in, with regard to the uh, actual uh, security controls. Uh, so just to briefly, uh, you know, I've, I've worked in the energy industry since uh, you know, 1990, really, and uh, have worked on energy industry standards since uh, 1995 at NASB. Uh, uh, NASB is the North American Energy Standards Board, and uh, it is one of two uh, ANSI standards development organizations that file their standards with FERC for consideration uh, as uh, ultimately regulations in the Code of Federal Reg Regulations. Uh, so NASB is one, and the other fancy STO that also falls with FERC is uh, NERC. You probably know NERC from uh, their SIP standards and all the good work they do on reliability. So uh, I guess to, to make to make a long story short, uh, so I'm a software engineer uh, and I, and that's the thing I love to do is develop software and I like standards a lot and uh, I do a lot of work in there. So hopefully that experience will uh, help you here today see some of the things that uh, that might be a benefit to you. So let's go ahead, PJ, and move to, go to the next slide. Okay. So. Uh, so what, the purpose of this talk is really going to be about uh, one particular standard within the NERC supply chain standards. And, uh, and there are several standards, you see SIP 13, SIP 10.3. This talk today is only about one particular requirement, which is the software verification requirement uh, that, uh, that uh, bulk electric system entities are uh, required to conduct in order to comply with NERC standards. And as you can see from the uh, two yellow boxes there, uh, that is the you know, verify the uh, identity of the uh, software source and the integrity of the software itself. Next slide. And uh, NERC provides very specific guidance uh, they have uh, endorsed this guidance, uh, which I'm showing you from the North American Transmission Forum, uh, that says that uh, uh, you can complete, basically, you can complete the verification of the identity of the software source and the verification of the integrity of the software obtained from the software source uh, using essentially digital signatures. And uh, just uh, last week, I, I reported to NERC and, and, and others that that this uh, this guidance is actually uh, not entirely accurate. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to show you that today in the demo why uh, using a digital signature alone uh, will not verify the 
identity of the software source. Next slide. And as I said, so is this guidance accurate? Uh, no, it's not. Actually, uh, it, it's it's uh, it's really dangerous. Actually, because if you do follow it to a T and just do a digital signature check, uh, you may find that you're installing some really really bad software into your environment, even though the digital signature comes back clean. So uh, the point I'll be making in this in this demo today is that you really need to. Uh, to verify the identity on, with two different steps. So you need to identify the party that produced the software. They're the guys who are making the claim that it's good. And, and then you need to verify the digital signature matches the name of the party that produced the software. You want to know that the person who actually signed it is the same person who is telling you or who's providing you the software. That way you'll know that this is an just the, the, the signature isn't by some party who didn't have anything to do with the software. I would maybe want to introduce you to a, a hack. So you really need to do both. Uh, you need to see both of those things. Next. So what I'm going to take you through uh, is the SAG PM process flow. Uh, the SAG PM is the software that Reliable Energy Analytics has produced and uh, makes available for uh, software supply chain risk assessments to the energy industry. And it, it has, uh, it follows seven uh, control steps and it has some scoring and, and, and some evidence uh, storage and other steps that it takes on uh, to, to provide this, you know, information about the actual risk assessment. So uh, the, it starts with the customer downloading a software object. I've already done that, so I'm not gonna do that in the demo. But I am going to start with the next step, which is the customer run SAG PM to verify the software object. And then we'll go down through the inspection, and the creation of the SBOM data, and all the verification steps that you see there, one through seven. I'm going to show you uh, the trust score, which we call SAG score at the very end. Uh, and the higher the SAG score, the more trustworthy an object is, including its supply chain, the checks that are being conducted. Uh, and then I'll show you uh, the proof of the proof of verification that NERC requires. And then I'll show you uh, the evidence data as well. Next slide. So one of the important things to understand about SAG PM is this methodology that uh, you really never should trust software and blindly install it. You, you should always verify it and report your results. Uh, Ideally, what we really want to do is, as we discover, uh, you know, risks uh, across the across the supply chain and across the industry, we want to make others aware that we have found uh, something bad, and we want to help them protect themselves from experiencing whatever badness exists in that bad software. So, uh, so the, so the notion here is, you never trust software; you always verify and report it. And I always verify, I always uh, do a SAG PM analysis assessment before I install anything. And corroborating evidence is key to establishing trust. And, and I think you're going to see that very clearly today uh, when I show you what it looks like when you, when you have an SBOM available, which is a software bill of materials. And you can see things like who's the supplier of the software and what, material, what, what components are they providing you in the software and so uh, you know, even today it's shocking to me but even today there are some uh, part, some malware scanning engines that fail to detect the malware used in the solar winds and uh, and so uh, thank you PJ I'll show my screen now so that you'll I can show you exactly uh, where did it go? Let's see, apparently I have lost it. I don't know why, but here's that. I'm going to go into the chat and get that. Uh, get that back. No, I'm going to go ahead and get that. And I'm going to show that screen now. Uh, PJ, can you see that? We can. And before you, you get into that, a question popped in, and I'm not sure if this is the right place to slot it, but they had asked Are the Canadian standards equivalent to the NERC SIP standards? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I do know that uh, the Canadians follow uh, 
FERC, and they do follow uh, at least the reliability standards of uh, NERC, uh, but I, I don't know if they are actually following the NERC uh, SIP standards, which are the cybersecurity. I suspect they are, because I've, I've had, uh, I've, I've talked with people from the IESO in Ontario who uh, work, in, work on these standards. So I suspect they do, but I'm not sure. Thank you. Cool. So here's what I want to show you today. So I mean, I think by now, uh, I don't think there's anyone on the planet that hasn't heard about the solar winds incursion. But surprisingly, and this is Virus Total, um, they're, they're really a malware service uh, provider. And what this is showing, uh, can you see my mouse okay there? Do you see it? I was muted, but yes, I see it. Okay, thanks. So he, what, what Virus Total does is it has 69 separate malware scanning engines that it uses to try to identify uh, bad software. And what this is saying that 53 out of the 69 are able to detect the solar winds uh, malware. And so if you scroll down, you see you know most of the usual names like Microsoft caught it and, and, and a bunch of others, uh, CrowdStrike caught it, Palo Alto caught it. But when you scroll down, you see that there are still some malware scanning engines uh, that didn't, uh, and some of those might be surprising to you. Uh, I know I, I was very surprised to see F-Secure there. I, I've heard they've been around for a long time, so I was very surprised that they see that they aren't detecting the solar winds malware. But uh, at any rate, so what this is showing really is the need to have a uh, you know a corroboration of evidence in order to try and reach a conclusion on uh, whether or not software is trustworthy. So with that. Uh, I will pass it back to you at this point, PJ. Okay, great. And we can go back to the presentation. And so this corroborating evidence concept is expressed in this triangle that you see here, that you've got vendor supply data that you will need uh, from the vendor, things like what are their signing keys and what's their legal name and other information. Uh, you're also going to want a, a software SBOM, a software bill of materials, and of course the digital signature, and, and other uh, information uh, I call ground truth, things like vulnerabilities, so that you can track this information on a regular basis. Next slide. Just to give you a sense, so SAG PM is, is actually a, what used to be called a client server uh, solution where the SAG PM software sits on the client side uh, and runs on a client PC, and there's a SAG server system that has some information that the SAG PM client needs. And uh, the SAG server is also where the evidence locker is stored uh, for tamper-proof uh, data, uh, tamper-proof evidence files. Uh, but elsewhere in this cloud is, of course, uh, the source location of the you know where the software is downloaded from. And, and the vendor questionnaire download site, the idea here is that a software vendor uh, has some information that's updated pretty regularly that they want to make available. And so they set it up as a separate download location and they update it as needed, things like if there's a new patch that comes out and other information. So what you'll notice here is that SAG PM has a uh, a vendor database, that's that blue cylinder looking thing at the bottom. And on the left side is the evidence folder that exists within the SAG PM system itself. And what we have right now in the red cylinder is uh, two programs, two applications that I'm going to do a uh, uh, do a, a, a risk assessment on. And the demos will be using uh, the NIST C-SCRM software and the Microsoft PowerShell software. Next slide, please. So during this demonstration, here's what you should be uh, taking away. I'm going to show you an SPDX SBOM when no SBOM is provided by a vendor. I'm going to demonstrate a suspicious digital signature and the warning that's issued by SAG PM when it detects this problem. And then I'll give you a sense for the three different evidence files that SAG PM produces. Uh, one is called an F850CR, which is all of the evidence data from the risk assessment. Uh, we all, SAG PM also creates the SBOM when, it, uh, when one doesn't exist, 
and lastly, the malware scanning results, in this case, Microsoft Defender. Uh, I will say that SAGVM does optionally uh, allow or support the use of Virus Total as a scanning service for those who would prefer to you know, use, you know, see the results of uh, you know, several different scanning engines as opposed to just seeing what Microsoft Defender can identify. Next slide. Okay, so we're going to do the CSCRM demonstration, and I'll go ahead and get that started for you right now. Okay, guys, can you see my screen, that black screen right there? You got it. Thank you. So uh, I've created a little batch file that actually runs SAG PM, and it takes one, this batch file takes one element, which is the, the file that I downloaded. So here you see this is the, I download, already downloaded the NIST uh, CSERM installer, and that's what we're going to do a risk assessment on right now. So one of the first things that, uh, that SAG PM wants to know is where did you get this file from, this software from? And so I, here I have a little cheat sheet, as you can see, I already have it stored. So I have to tell SAG PM where I got the file from. And this will, you'll see that this is important when we get to doing the provenance checking. And so the first thing that SAG PM does is it looks inside this file and it tries to uh, identify the various components that are in it and other information. Um, and it creates, it actually creates an SPDX SBOM of this information as well. So here you see that the product licensor is NIST, and the product name is uh, C-SCRM, and the version is 1.0.0. And I really want you to pay particular attention to this item right here, this product licensor name, because that's the party that actually claims to have developed the software and is the licensor of the software. So these are what you would think of as the source of the software. And here you see that um, SAG PM uh, does a, a, a trust score, gives you a trust score at each of the various uh, steps in the, in, in the process. So here you see that uh, it is calculated, it uses a st statistical calculation to come up with these, but it basically several factors that go into this and we'll talk about those later. But the trust score in this step, this step is 81, which isn't bad really. And going on. So now uh, SAG PM says, okay, well, you told me which server this came from, uh, and I'm gonna go look at the certificate for that source server. And it goes out and it says, oh, okay, well, that actually came from nvd.nist.gov, and it, that, uh, that's, a, that's what the certificate says at that site. It's signed from, by Digicert, and, uh, and, and a big warning here that NIST is not found in the vendor database. And that's because I didn't set it up in the SAGPM database. And that just, I want to show you that uh, you can really run SAGPM on any uh, binary image. Uh, you don't have to have it in, you know, have a, a specific vendor uh, listed in the database. You'll get warnings like you see here, and your know, trust score will look good. Uh, because uh, it does check to make sure that the data that we see as ground truth matches what's in the uh, data that's discovered uh, in, in the objects themselves. So you see the trust score for this is zero because of, it's not in the database. So the next thing it does is it, it, it does a malware scan on, on the object that we downloaded. And before it does that, though, it updates the signatures to make sure uh, we have the latest and greatest malware signatures uh, available to us. And uh, we need to do this because you know, malware is discovered uh, just ad hoc. It can come up at any moment uh, if someone discovers a new malware. And so it's important to make sure that you update the malware signature data, signatures before you do a malware scan. Uh, and this, this takes a couple of moments because this is a fairly large uh, application. Uh, but uh, uh, it'll it'll come back to you here very shortly. I ran this this morning, so I know that there are no uh, there are no malware risks in the software. You'll see that here very very shortly. It goes as expected. And and in this case here, you notice it says using Microsoft Defender. 
Um, if you had specified virus total, then it would have used virus total to conduct this malware scan. Uh, but mal but but that requires a separate uh, a separate license from virus total to use that service, and uh, that's something that has to be acquired separately from SecDM. So Microsoft Defender did not find any uh, vulnerabilities. So the malware trust score comes back as 100. It is very trustworthy. There are no uh, viruses identified in this uh, application. Now here's where things get a little bit interesting. Uh, that software that we're running this risk assessment on, which was provided by NIST, it's actually signed by a company called the Boston Consulting Group. So this is different from the name of the guy who actually claims you have supplied it. Uh, but th some things, some additional things that say, you know, does it warn you if there's an expired cert in the chain? Uh, it warns you if the, if, if the signature is more than a year old, and you can see. So it, it's giving you some sense for, you know, how trustworthy is this digital certificate? for this particular software application. And then finally, um, what comes back is, uh, you can see right here, it says number of files successfully verified, one. No warnings, no errors. But what SAG-PM points out is, oh, hold on here. This digital signature doesn't match with what's in the product licensor name in the file properties. This is a very high risk. And the next warning is uh, unable to match that digital signature with the vendor database. So here are two things that should really give you a reason to pause and ask, hmm, is this thing trustworthy? And so, as you can see, SAG-PM says that you get a trust score of only 29, which is very low. And it's because of, of these two issues right here, that the licensor and the signer are two different entities. And there's no way to verify that that this signer is actually authorized to sign that NIST software. So this is this is a very big issue. In fact, um, there's some guidance provided by NERC uh, that says that you can verify the source, uh, the software support source, and the integrity of the software by simply checking the digital signature. So what that really says is if you get this kind of result. No errors, no warnings. Everything's good to go. The reality is that uh, that, that may not be the case. Uh, in fact, uh, just to prove to myself that anyone could sign anything, I took the NIST software myself and I uh, slapped my own signature on it. And guess what? It came back the same way as, as, as the fully verified, no errors, no warnings. Uh, but of course, you know, SAG PM did you know did indicate that even with my own signature of course i'm not the product licensor so it it, uh, it, it also reported that as well so this is a risky situation that uh, you need to avoid or be aware of uh, i have already reported this situation to NERC uh, that their guidance for uh, using a digital signature alone to validate a software supply source uh, is invalid and that could lead to some very a dangerous software being in, installed in the electric grid. So. Hey, Dick, we had a, a quick question come in <clears throat> looking at your screen, and they say, why is the warning showing zero, but you have two warnings in SAG-PM? Okay, that's a great question. So the information that I'm showing above that says number of warnings zero and number of errors zero, that's actually produced by the sign tool, Microsoft sign tool. So if you use, a, and this is one of the issues, if you use a sign tool today, to verify uh, this digital signature, it's really not verifying the relationship between the signer and the person who built or licenses the software. It's just asking, is the signature valid? And in fact, it is indeed a valid signature, but is it the signature that was authorized to sign the NIST software? Well, in my case, the answer is no, I was not authorized to sign the NIST software. I asked what well, was was Boston Consulting Group authorized to sign the, uh, the, the NIST software? And their answer, the answer is you don't know. So the information you see there about successfully verified, that is what is being reported by Microsoft Sign Tool to validate the digital signature. 
Uh, however, what SAG PM points out is that this signer information and the product licensure information in the SBOM don't match. And, and this is something you should be really, really careful of. I hope that answered the question. I think so. <laughs> I don't see a follow up quite. Well, follow up with me if you'd like. I, I'm happy to answer that. But that that result that you see with the number of warnings and error zero is from Sign Tool, uh, which validates. Thanks for the question. Okay. So the next thing that happens is um, uh, SAG PM uh, looks at the S bomb that was created. Uh, and in this case, it only found two items within the uh, binary object. Uh, some are more revealing than others. So in this case, you'll see right here that shows the number of components found in, in this binary were only two. And with that, it goes out to the NIST NDD site to check for vulnerabilities. And so in this case, uh, there were no vulnerabilities reported. So SAG PM says, okay, this looks like a good uh, trust score and it assigns 100 because no vulnerabilities were found. And then we'll move on. The next thing uh, SAG PM does is it looks in the vendor information that was supplied, the vendor questionnaire. Remember that uh, I showed in the cloud that vendors provide information about their product and it can change um, almost constantly, really, especially if there are new patches released. So what SAGPM does is it goes and grabs that vendor information and, uh, and it tries to see if it can validate it with what it knows from the previous steps and what's in the vendor database. And because it was unable to verify the product information in the questionnaire, it's a very high risk. And so there's a trust score of zero for this step. Uh, the next item is what's called a provenance verification. And, uh, and this is an area that really needs a lot more work in terms of what the industry uh, is going to do to validate provenance. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussion on the way now as to how, how do you provide some evidence of uh, trustworthy evidence to a software customer to show that the software that you're providing them has indeed been well cared for and kept safe and hasn't been uh, place in the hands of any bad guys. Uh, so here, what I'm showing, uh, what, what SAGPM is doing, is going out to uh, that download location and it's tracing the, the route that was used to download the software to see if there are any you know, bad guys in the middle. And so we look for things like blacklisted IP addresses. So if there was a blacklisted IP, it would show up here. We warn you when, uh, you know, when an IP address is outside of the United States so you can be aware that you know if it, if it goes you know if it, if it goes through Iran you might want to you know pay careful attention to installing the software. Hey, um, hey Dick yeah. um, we had another question come in from an audience member and they say what kind of trust score would be high enough for an average software user those of us that are not deemed cybersecurity experts uh, to feel convinced enough to proceed with their respective work? That's a that's a really good question, and, and it really it really depends on your uh, risk posture. Uh, some uh, some parties will say, okay, a, a SAG score below 80 is unacceptable because there's too much risk. Uh, a SAG score below 90 is too, is unacceptable. So it really boils down to what's your risk posture. Uh, where is this software being installed? If, if this software is being installed in a, in a safety protection system, uh, you might be really, really careful uh, and, and not let anything get installed if, if, if uh, you know, a SAG score less than, say, 90. Uh, because SPS systems are so critical and, and lives depend on them. Uh, now, if this, is, uh, if, if this software is for uh, a website where you keep you know, some uh, recipes of your favorite cookies, uh, you know, Maybe a 50 is good enough. Now, having said that, recognize that any site, any software that's installed that has vulnerabilities can wreak some really serious havoc on you. So uh, if you say, gee, it's only this, it's only my cookie website, so I'm not really gonna be concerned. The problem is that your cookie website might be on a network with you know, another, 
another system that you care about. Like you know, maybe it's on the same system as your payroll or your employee database. There's reason to be cautious at any level with software that doesn't look trustworthy. Good, good, good answer. And before you go on, one more quick question. Is SAG PM only Windows based uh, or supports other operating systems like Mac OS, Linux? Or if not, how would you approach those cases? Okay, so the, the way we do that, uh, SAG PM only runs on Windows 10 Pro. Uh, and it's because we rely so much on uh, the cybersecurity capabilities of the platform, uh, like Sign Tools, an example, and the other crypto libraries. But it, you can use SAG PM to uh, test any uh, any program. It doesn't matter whether it's Linux or Microsoft or even a, a firmware. Uh, you can download that software and put it in a, and run it through SAG PM. It will try its best to figure out what's in it and give you an S bomb. I, I will say that the the ideal case is that the uh, software provider, the software licensor provides us with an S-bomb and we don't have to guess. And, and this is becoming an even more critical requirement. I think there's an executive order that's supposed to come out this week that's going to require uh, government agencies uh, to mandate their software vendors provide them with S-bombs. Uh, at least that's the rumor I've heard. But you can run, it only runs on Windows, but you can test virtually any binary object with it. Thanks, Dick. Now, I uh, I happen to know that this provenance check is going to fail because Amazon uh, doesn't allow uh, doesn't allow the type of uh, internet protocol that's needed to check the trace on the route. So, as you can see, it says here the man in the middle trace failed, uh, and so the trust score for this provenance check is zero. So here we get to the end. We've gone through the seven steps, and SAG PM has calculated a SAG score of 37.45. And uh, I personally would never install this software on anything. I even have a Raspberry Pi that I, I, I mess around with. I wouldn't even put it on there because it's on the network. So, so here I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna fail it. I just have to put F in, and I'm gonna say that uh, can't. Cross the digital signature, and I'm just going to put dash mismatch. Okay. Uh, so I, I mentioned to you that this uh, this information uh, that, that SAG PM uh, is, was designed for the energy industry to meet that one year standard, and that that standard says that you must provide for, for an audit for a NERC audit. You must provide evidence of, uh, of the actual verification having been performed. So what SAG PM does is it, is it gives you that uh, proof of verification, which you would then copy and paste into your change management system. And, and after you do that, uh, you can continue on in the process. And so now uh, SAG has put all of that evidence data and other material into the evidence locker. So I'll just go ahead and show you the different files that SAG PM has uh, produced. And so here are the three files that are produced. So this one right here, that's the S-bomb that SAG PM created for the NIST software. This, uh, this is the evidence report. This is the result of all those steps that you just saw SAG PM go through. And this is the information you would provide to an auditor that came in uh, to be able to prove that you did the verification and show them the specific results. And, uh, and then the lastly is the results of the malware scan that uh, we saw uh, was reported as uh, good by SAG PM and Microsoft Defender. Uh, SAG PM does come with a viewer, uh, an evidence viewer. Uh, and so let me go show you what that looks like now. Uh, I don't I don't want to dump the whole file because that can be that can take a while. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, hey, just just show me the score 
the, the scores that uh, SAGPM produced at each step. And so it's just going to pull out the scores from each of those various steps and show you. So here was the result of the introspection. And so you can see that uh, the introspection results here uh, look uh, pretty darn bad. Okay. And uh, the score data for the source server results, uh, you can see we also had some uh, some element of risk, but not much. It looks like there is there's a the risk with the vendor not found. Well, this one this one's a little worse than, than the other one. And uh, the malware scan came back clean with a zero. And the digital signature results, uh, as you can see, there were a couple of issues in there. They got the expired cert timestamp and the other information, uh, the other checks. And then the vulnerability risks uh, and the vendor verification results, all bad. Uh, man in the middle trace, all bad, didn't work out too well. And then, of course, you, there's that final SAG score again. So you can you can easily examine the scores for that, uh, that SAG can produce for each of those various steps and the final score as well. So uh, that's the, that's to show you uh, the case where there could be a bad guy who has digitally signed a software object uh, without authorization, and they're trying to sneak it past your uh, installation procedure. I will tell you that I was able to successfully validate the signature on the NIST uh, on the NIST uh, uh, software, uh, including the one that I created on it. And I was able to install that software without a hiccup, no warnings, no nothing, and the software ran. So trusting that a digital signature is, uh, is secure and uh, trustworthy is, is not a very good uh, idea. So now I'm going to go. I'm going to go and show you uh, a bigger scenario. This is the this is the uh, uh, PowerShell for any of those who are familiar with Microsoft PowerShell. Uh, and here I'm trying to show you just how ginormous some of these S bombs can be. And this is uh, these are not these things are not really designed for human consumption. You really need a tool like S bomb or some others to uh, to do what I'm showing you here. So here again uh, we start it up, and I've got to go get the, uh, the information on the PowerShell. So I downloaded the PowerShell from this location on GitHub. And so I tell SAG PM that's where it came from. And here you see that the manufacturer is Microsoft and the product code is what it is and version and so forth. Uh, but this, uh, this, pro this information didn't check out too well. And, and the reason for that is because there is, uh, I know that there's no data in the database for this, in the vendor database. So uh, this will not get a very good score. And then uh, verifying the source server. So here we're verifying uh, GitHub. And again, that's where the data was, uh, the program was downloaded from. And that gets a trust score 22. And here again, uh, we go through the malware scan. And once again, we update the signatures. And then we uh, will actually perform the malware scan. It takes a few moments. And uh, so this uh, th this version of the software is, is relatively new. Uh, it was uh, officially released on the 30th of April, so uh, it's it's it could could use just a lot more uh, exposure. Make sure we're, we're capturing some of the edge cases, uh, properly calculating scores for the various conditions. All right, so you see there were no vulnerabilities found here. Uh, and so uh, here, what you find is that uh, uh, SAG PM, uh, using the sign tool, again, said, hey, this, uh, this signature is valid, and there are no warnings or errors. But you'll notice that this time, SAG PM didn't raise a warning about the disconnect between the uh, signer's uh, name and the, and the licensor's name. So here you, say, you see that the signature and the certificate belongs to Microsoft Corporation, 
And as you go back, you see that that does indeed match. So SAG PM did not issue a warning here because the signature and the license or manufacturer in the space appear to be uh, consistent. It looks like an authorized. Uh, Dick, we had a question pop in here specifically on this. Uh, is the vendor database populated by the user or through the uh, SAG PM update? Oh, good. Yeah, I can. So SAG PM provides, uh, when installed, it has a placeholder vendor database that contains the information for REA, Reliable Energy Analytics. And, and I do that so that you can verify uh, SAG PM itself using SAG PM. Uh, but what we ask uh, customers to do, uh, and really require it, is to move that placeholder database or copy that database to a secure location uh, where it can't be overlaid by any future updates. So that uh, we, may, we make that very clear in the installation instructions that customers should copy that placeholder database, it's just an Excel file really, into a location uh, and then uh, and, and, and that's safe. It won't be overlaid by any future releases. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. And another yeah. one, um, I don't know if this is quite the right time, but it, they, they're asking about how does the trustworthiness and verification uphold the ca capability of software functions support and not just indicate corruptions? Hopefully I read that. A little, you broke up a little, PJ. Try that again. Let me, let me read it again. It says, how does trustworthiness and verification hold up the capability of software functions support? and not just indicate corruptions. Yeah, I, 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 I'm gonna do a little bit of interpretation on that, but it, uh, it's really not, IPM is not really checking for corruption. It's, it's really looking for evidence of risk, you know, evidence that there's something in this combination of data that should give rise to, you know, that should serve as an alert you really should think twice before installing a software package. It, it doesn't really speak to the uh, to the functional aspects of the software itself. It, it just uh, it, in fact, it, it's really designed to be used before you ever attempt to install software. Mm -hmm. The problem is, and a lot of people today are using tools like network scanners, and, and those are very valuable and useful. The problem is, uh, they they are an after the fact uh, indicator. So you only know that you've been compromised because they've already made it into your network because the network scanning tool told, or IDS told you they did. Uh, what SAGPM tries to do is it tries to prevent uh, that software from ever getting installed to begin with. And you know, it's, what's interesting, you know, you think about this, right? People with, um, with food allergies are all too familiar with the risk of just blindly consuming a product. Uh, I mean, they've had some really violent reactions to eating things like peanuts and seafood and such. Uh, so what you'll find is uh, people with uh, you know, food allergies will look at the ingredients list and say, is there anything in here that can harm me? And based on that, they make a decision to consume it or not. The same is true with SAG-PM. SAG-PM tries to do, provide that same level of transparency to say, hey, here is this software package. And here's what I found out about it. Um, do you think it's safe to take? Is it safe to install? And so you can think about that, you know, that, 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 that scenario with the food allergy folks and the ingredients list and what SAG PM is trying to provide is that same level of security or at least some indication of trust uh, within uh, a software update before you install it. Okay, that was probably a bit too wordy. Sorry about that. I love that. I love the illustration. <laughs> okay, so now uh, what you see is that uh, with regard to the digital validation, because the vendor, because the signature name matched with the licensor, uh, you, you don't get that warning, and you actually see an improved SAG score. Still not great, <clears throat> but it's an improvement, and that. Uh, and the things that uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, maybe don't make that so great are, let me just look at this and see. Oh, one of them in particular I already know. So one of the things that SAG, SAG will discount for or show, uh, you know, some concern with 
is uh, a case where a software, uh, a C8, an issuer of a cert, uh, is not listed in one of its trusted uh, certificates or, or trusted routes. And uh, one of the things here is that uh, this guy, this guy right here, who si actually signed the soft, the, uh, the the certificate on behalf of this guy right here, the, the issue, the signing cert that was used to sign this Microsoft uh, Corporation mm -hmm. digital certificate. Uh, this guy right here is not listed in one of SAG's trusted certificate authorities. So that's the reason why you would see uh, the CBIS a lower a lower uh, or trust score for that. So this would this is intended to catch things like you know is this a self signed certificate? If it is, don't trust it at all. That's the sort of thing. Okay. So now uh, I want to point out this to you right here. Look at how many components were identified in the SBOM for PowerShell, 983. So what SAG-PM does is says, okay, well, let's, uh, let's see if there are any vulnerabilities that may have uh, maybe present in any of those 983 components. And so it's going out to uh, the NIST NVD database and it's issuing these searches for vulnerabilities for each and every component. And uh, I will tell you that the, the NIST NVD database um, does have some things that I, I would like to see improved. Uh, like you see right now, it's the, the performance is rather uh, ad hoc. You don't know if you, it's not predictable performance. And so you'll see how we're stuck on this one, one component. Uh, sometimes it'll get past this and sometimes it will, you know, the, the NIST NVD server just peels over and that for a failure. It's, um, I, I've raised this as a concern uh, with several parties now, and uh, we, we really need to have a, a more robust uh, vulnerabilities uh, cert capability, uh, not just for because it, you know, the, the performance requirements, but we also need to eliminate too many false positives being reported. So uh, either NIST NVD is going to come out of its slumber, or it's going to sag pin and tell us that it peeled over. So those are the two most frequent outcomes when you see this happening. So let's just give it another few minutes to see if we can get this to uh, jump back and put us back in service. And Dick, while that's uh, while that's rendering, we had a question come in here. And they're asking, would it be possible for NIST or other institutions to set up cybersecurity programs to help train the average software users with constant refreshment and updates to be more effective in their daily work life in the modern world while leaving the heavy lifting to the cybersecurity experts to deal with? Yeah, that's actually a really good point, uh, a good question. Yeah, NIST, uh, NIST is really actually quite good at providing guidance. Uh, they they have lots and lots of documentation that they provide, um, and there are there are different uh, you know different parties that uh, uh, provide education or training on some of those practices. But but the missing piece of the puzzle is the you know the actual program that implements that great advice, and that was one of the that was, that was one of the, mo the motivators for me with SAG PM is I was saying, gee, we've got all this great advice, but some of it requires people with real cybersecurity expertise. And so what I tried to do was take that, those missed best practices in the cybersecurity framework and codify them in SAG PM so that a party wouldn't have to be a cybersecurity expert to get the protections, uh, the cyber the uh, supply chain protection that could help them keep the bad guys out. So you can go to the uh, materials, the guidance that's available, uh, but uh, chances are quite good. It, 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 
you're going to need to have a, a PhD in cybersecurity to really sort of implement some solutions. With SAG PM, I wanted to uh, provide uh, provide a solution to the smaller electric utilities and smaller entities in any of industry really uh, to be able to detect these risky situations in software. Thank you. You're welcome. So it's not looking too good here. It looks like uh, NIST NVD has uh, bailed out on us here. And uh, I think the timeout is, unfortunately, I think I've got it set for 15 minutes at the moment. Uh, so uh, rather than wait for uh, NIST NVD to come back here, I'm just going to go ahead and just going to sit down. There we go. Oh, interesting. Maybe it just needed a little attention from me. And you remember I said there were 983 individual components. Well, SAGPM is going to go through each and every one of them looking for vulnerabilities. And uh, as you can see, uh, it has indeed found some vulnerabilities. Found three of them with this particular component that was uh, identified in PowerShell. And you can see what it does, what SAGPM does, is it shows you each one of those vulnerabilities so that you can look at it and decide if in fact this is something that you should pay attention to. One thing you'll find with this uh, NVT is that you see a lot of false positives, a real lot of false positives. And so it's important to review each of these to decide if indeed it's a reason for concern. SAGPM can't tell because it doesn't have the ability to take that description information and, uh, and give you a sense for whether or not this is a real concern. So this is the human aspect of doing the risk assessment that, that um, it still has to play out. Hey, Dick, now, we had another question pop in. It says, does SAGPM work and integrate well with the FireEye product? Um, I, You know, I really don't. Uh, know anything about the FireEye product, so I, I really can't answer it. I, I can tell you that, you know, SAG PM, uh, we, we have a Microsoft installer that we provide, and it, it, uh, so it installs using the standard Microsoft software. So I would assume it can live side by side with FireEye, but uh, don't, don't quote me on that. Um, okay, so what SAGPM does, as I said, it shows you the vulnerabilities, but when it finds one, it gives you two, uh, really three options. You can continue to look at the next vulnerability, so it found three of them, which all you got to do is hit the enter key, and it'll move on. And then it goes to the next vulnerability, so you see we were looking at 1149 there, now we're looking at 0192 here. And uh, so, what you could do is you could say, hey, you know what? I don't want to see any more vulnerabilities for this. I've seen enough. You could skip and say, go to the next component in the list and continue searching. Or you could say, there are 983 uh, uh, components that this thing is going to process. And if you come across a, a vulnerability that is something you really should be concerned about, and you should not install the software. Uh, we just you can just quit out of this and say, look, I've seen enough. I don't need to see any more. So you can just quit, and, and, and we'll just go down and, and give you a final score of zero because it found a vulnerability. We gave it a score of zero. And again, uh, this uh, Microsoft information is not in the SAG PM database, so you get all these warnings that the vendor data is missing, they didn't provide a questionnaire, and so we're unable to verify the software product information in the, in the questionnaire. They didn't provide us one, so the trust score is zero. So now we're going to go to uh, GitHub, which is where the Microsoft software was downloaded from PowerShell, and we're going to do that provenance check there. And uh, this one succeeded this morning, so it should succeed again, which I hope it will.
and that's just going to keep going. Uh, actually, this one I think has a, a location outside the U.S. Actually, so you see that one. I think it did. Yeah, there it is. So you see, one of those IP addresses is actually Sweden. So, so that and, and site PM just want to make you aware that this this site is outside the U.S. It will ding it a little bit in the SAG score for that because uh, you know, we, we get a higher uh, cross rating to anything in the U.S. But anything outside of the U.S. will 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 have a higher risk associated with it. And so the trace completed. Uh, you can see the trust score for this trace is only 17, very low, mainly because of all the outside uh, outside IP addresses outside the U.S. And then you know you can see the SAG score is pretty low here, 35.65. So this is uh, this is uh, definitely not something you would really want to install. It's got too much uh, too much risk with it. And here again, you have your proof of verification. This is what you, if you were in the bulk electric system, uh, expect and required to apply with NERC SIP, you would take this information right here and you would copy it and put it into your change management system. And that's what you would show the auditors when they come into town, you know, to, to prove that you uh, did indeed follow the standard and did the verification. And and that's uh, that's the end of it. Uh, so uh, let's see, do another viewer for you if you'd like. Uh, whoops, oh, you already took it back, BJ? Oh, we're almost over. I did, we're just about done in our time. Um, I think we've addressed all the questions so far on the floor, but I wanted to give just a minute in case anyone had last minute questions for you. While we're waiting for folks to uh, sort of chime in, Richard, what? how would you summarize? What are the biggest lessons learned or, or bullet points that you would want folks to really come away with? I, I think the, the big thing that this points out to me is that our software supply chain is very challenging to verify today. And we really need to uh, focus on getting some pieces in place to help with that. And, and one of those key pieces is called the Software Bill of Materials. The Department of Commerce is working diligently to uh, come up with some guidelines or papers, if you will, to help us understand what an SBOM is and why it's important. So I would say first and foremost, uh, ask your software vendors to provide you with an SBOM so that you can now start to detect things like anomalies between, hey, what's the supplier name? And what was the digital signature that was used? And if there's a, if there's a mismatch there, you probably want to know about it. So that, that, that'd be the first thing is to get that software bill of materials. And, and I guess one last thing I'll point out is that uh, there aren't very many vendors in this space. Uh, I, I can think of five actually. But there are two different models of implementation. There's a service-based model where you would uh, outsource to a service entity uh, to have them do basically the same thing that I showed here with SAG PM. And then there's the on-site solution, which is what SAG PM does. Is it, it's designed to operate within a, uh, a, a customer site as opposed to having an external service. I think either one is better than anything we have today. So if you prefer a service model, there are some really good vendors out there. If you prefer an on-site model, uh, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. I love that, Dick. Hey, we did have a question pop in here, um, and the asker is, is wanting to know, other than capturing the one text line to show the auditor, is there a history component that can be used to research previously run Validation scans? Uh, there is indeed. Uh, so what SAGPM does, I didn't go through that, but SAGPM uh, logs every uh, every one of those uh, proof of verifications. And in, in that log, it shows you the name of the evidence file that goes with it. So if you wanted to get in and see the actual details, uh, you could go into that, uh, that SAGPM uh, proof of verification log and find every single case uh, that uh, for a particular product and version that was run uh, and, and its results by pulling up the evidence file with the viewer. Mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you, Dick. I think we're just about out of time. So, Great. Oh, go ahead, please. Do you have any yeah, final I just remarks? want to say one thing. I, you know, I, I just want to say thank you so much to Energy Central. Um, I, you know, I joined Energy Central in 2018, and uh, I have to say, it's a, it's amazing to me how much you can learn on that site. It, this, it, being a, a member of Energy Central is like plugging into the real-time consciousness of the electric industry. Uh, people are talking about things that are, are going to happen way before it shows up in the media or news outlets. So if you really want to get a sense for things that are happening in the energy industry on a real-time basis, uh, then I would encourage you to join the Energy Central community and uh, and contribute. It, a lot of people are out here sharing their knowledge and expertise. So I think uh, you know your contributions will also be valuable, and you might uh, find a few things uh, worthy uh, that worthy uh, or uh, knowledgeable uh, learning for yourself as well. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. That's fantastic. And you can connect with Dick also on EnergyCentral.com. Membership is free, and we do invite you to engage with him and with all of us over there on the community. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed today's Power Talk. As you log off, please take a moment to give us your feedback so we can continue to provide you with great events such as today's. Thank you for attending, and this will conclude today's presentation.